Okay. Okay. Good morning, everybody. This is the um, monthly spotlight community call. It's March 2nd, 2018. And we're very pleased to have two people, two people with us today demoing their respective spotlight ecosystems. Um, the first person up for, for about the first 15 minutes will be Jen Colt from Cornell University. Jen will be followed by Jesse Keck from Stanford University. We'd like to ask that people hold their questions to the end. So you're welcome to put them in the chat channel or um, just hold them in your head and we'll have, we'll have about 15 or 20 minutes at the end for questions. So um, go ahead, Jen. Thank you. I'm going to see if I can share my screen here. And I sort of thought about the best way to go through this. Hopefully everybody's seeing my screen now. And I think what I'm going to do is start from the outside and work in. Um, so if you can see my Google Chrome window, um, you should see our digital collection site. And this is where we're sort of aggregating um, images, some things that we have in um, Samvera, and some things that we have in Kaltura. Um, so there's images, there's books, and there's a little bit of AV in here. And this index, um, because it's bringing all those different things together, already has a mapping so that we can have facets and things that make sense to have in blacklight, which is what this is based on, and what um, Spotlight is also based on. I can see my internet's being a little slow. There's branding up here. Um, and I just mentioned that because for our Spotlight exhibit, um, in our setup, we ask people to publish to our digital collections site first and then reuse those items in their exhibit. Um, and that lets us know basically what their metadata fields are going to be ahead of time. It lets us know that they have IIIF ready if they're bringing in images and that sort of thing. Um, we do also have people who just upload images and then we do also do bulk upload for people when they want that. Um, but that's not really our preferred system. Um, but it is, it is there. So anyway, so this is the digital collection site and this is our exhibit site. Now our exhibit site is much smaller than Stanford's. <laughs> they have like 40 or something, and we just got our second one up. Um, but hopefully this is still maybe useful to people who are unsure about whether they can do Spotlight with few resources. Um, we brought Spotlight into Cornell where we were already using Blacklight and we were already using Sanvera. So we did have a lot of knowledge in that sense. Um, but we don't have a big spotlight team. We basically have me, another UX person, and then two other developers, but almost all of the real maintenance work is being done by me, and then the other UX person is doing most of the documentation and, um, and walking through things with the curator. So that's sort of how we split things up. But we're doing it with, without a lot of staff, basically, which is... Um, obvious when you look at our site compared to Stanford's, but I do think it's um, fulfilling the need we wanted it to, um, which is to give people a new way to get some exhibits online. So these are both pretty simple. Um, this one was for student portfolios and it was an upload site. And this one is for an exhibit that was a physical exhibit last fall. Um, and they wanted to get an online record of it up. And it was also done through uploads. Um, my little thing here is kind of covering this. Okay, um, so this is what it looks like for the end user. We have done very, very little customization. And like I said, because we have don't have a lot of development resources on this, that's our strategy, um, is to not do customization for people to say, look, this is the state of it. This is what we can offer, kind of take it or leave it. Um, and to focus our attention on bug fixes when they come up and on deployment and on building connectors to um, the main digital collections portal and potentially to other places. So we're really focused on bringing the content in and connecting it to the rest of our system as opposed to um, 
adding new widgets or features or things like that to spotlight itself. Um, we did build a little site for our content contributors. And so this is really focused on like how you get an exhibit, which like I said, like you write to me and you ask, and then I make it for you. Um, we so far are finding our curators to be like very self-sufficient. Like we set it up for them and then they just get in there and start doing stuff. We tell them that this is still sort of new and pilot-ish. And so when they run into difficulty, not to bang their heads, but to let us know as soon as possible uh, what kind of issues they're running into. And then we either explain to them how to do it or we make a ticket and we fix bugs if we need to. Um, and so this is just like one page kind of describing all the, all the widgets that they have available to them, mostly to help them understand what they can do and understand how useful the existing widgets are because they are pretty good um, so that they don't feel like there's something they can't do. Like pretty much if they look through all the widgets, if we give them a little nudge where they need it, they can, they're able to do the, um, the kind of layouts that they want. And so that makes everybody happy. We have um, an internal wiki for the developers. This is public, so anybody can look at it, but it's not where we send curators. Um, so this is where I've been putting little notes about how to do different ingest processes, basically. Um, and so just I only, only today added the one for um, the portal ingest. But so there's a little bit of directions here for a person who's working with the, the curator um, so that we have information to fall back on to be able to tell people what to do. For importing items, um, we are seeing that as this part of the service that we'll provide, like we'll help them get their items in there um, because that's a little bit more technical and I don't want it to be a barrier to people getting started. So I'm willing to say, we'll spend some time with you at the beginning make sure the items you want are in there so you can do your part of the job um, and you won't have to worry about this part. And then, um, so here's the directions for basically importing from that large blacklight site if you wanted to do an exhibit of items just selected from there. And this is sort of dependent on being able to run a query that gives you a reasonable setback. Um, our rare and manuscripts department we're hoping will be a big consumer of this. And they, for instance, put an identifier on everything that was digitized for a specific exhibit. So they'll be able to search for that exhibit's identifier and then bring all of the digital objects related to that exhibit into their Spotlight site with the query. We also have um, instructions here for importing from a spreadsheet, which is sort of our second most favorite way of doing it. And the way this works is that I take their images and put them on S3 uh, so that they are publicly available to Spotlight. And then we clean up their metadata and open refine and uh, spit out a CSV and then upload that to Spotlight. This touches on one thing that I haven't made an issue for, but that would really help us a lot, which would be that when we import from a spreadsheet, if we could assign the IDs, Right now, when you import from a spreadsheet, they get the, the spotlight generated IDs, which is fine. But if we could bring in our own, then we would also be able to update via spreadsheet. And that would essentially make it almost as good as a direct pull from the repository. Um, so that's something we'd like to work on or see, see if other people in the community are interested in. Or maybe there's like some easy way to do it and I've just been too dumb to figure it out and someone will tell me. Um, so those are the two main um, sort of ways of getting large amounts of images in. Um, this is our GitHub repo. There's nothing particularly special in here. Um, one of the other developers did work on the developer documentation for if you wanted to run this locally, which was helpful because we were bringing in devs that don't usually work on this. And so it was nice that he did this sort of explain to them what Solar Wrapper is, which for a lot of us in the Samvera and Blacklight community, that's like Solar Wrapper, but to people just getting started, they don't know. Um, and so that was more helpful documentation to have. 
And then I just wanted to show, so this is, so, so I sort of had two ways to go today. One was to like run around and pretty everything up. And the other was to just kind of show you um, what stuff looks like. Uh, so I didn't have time to pretty things up. So things just are the way they are. So this is my commit from when I added the portal in Jester. So I just wanted to show you this. Um, it, when you look at the main spotlight project, in the wiki, there's a place called resource scenarios, and that outlines how to add these external resources. Um, and so that's what this is. So we were bringing in images that already had IIIF because they're in uh, JSTORs, now um, what used to be Art Store shared shelf. Um, and so I just had to tell them, you know, tell Spotlight what field that, that manifest was going to be in. This is just sort of setting up that the thing exists. And then you can define what kind of fields are going to be coming in for that exhibit. And so that's what I put in this, in this portal, portal builder um, file. It's just like a little mapping from the, the main Blacklight project mapping to our spotlight. Um, and this is also pretty simple, but it, and it makes it so that the, um, you keep, when you import this way, you keep the IDs that were in the original application. And so there's some little pointing around here to help things stay connected. Uh, and then you have to build a form, which is pretty simple. Uh, and that's what this is. Like you probably shouldn't put your solar URL in there, mine's in there. I know that it's locked behind um, having to log in. So I didn't worry about it too much, but you probably shouldn't do that. Uh, and then there's the, the place where you can write in the labels and a quick little migration. Uh, Eric at Yale helped me with this because uh, I had forgotten to, to do this part when I was trying to get this to work. Um, I think that that's kind of an overview of what we've done. Hopefully that's, that was fast, but hopefully helpful. And I guess we're gonna do questions at the end. Unless Kathy can think of anything else that I should point out before stopping. Thank you, Jen, this is really great. Um, appreciate your, your time. Um, I think we can, um, if you would just mute yourself, Jen, and then Jesse, unmute and you are good to go. All right, great. Um, uh, Jen, if you could stop uh, sharing your screen, I think I'll be able to take the screen share over. Um, so uh, my name is uh, Jesse Keck, and I'm uh, one of the software developers um, that works on our exhibits um, platform at, um, at Stanford University. Um, so I'm just trying to get my screen share up here. All right, perfect. Um, okay, cool. Um, so. Um, I'm just going to kind of show you, um, I think, uh, Jen, thank you very much. I think you did a great job, particularly of showing like kind of the um, uh, sort of the process and kind of what's involved with uh, from the code level about how you get a resource into, uh, into a spotlight instance. That was really great to see. Um, so I'll kind of show kind of through our application some of the customizations that we have uh, implemented in um, into um, our exhibits app. Uh, so um, one of the first things, I'll, I'll kind of show a couple of the more, maybe like the, 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 the simple things um, that we've done. And, uh, and then I'll kind of end with kind of how our indexing pipeline works, uh, similar to what, to, to what uh, Jen was showing. Um, okay, so one of the things that uh, it's actually, um, this is not necessarily a customization that we've done in our application, but it might be something that people aren't um, actually familiar with, uh, which is the ability to create themes uh, that can be set on a per exhibit basis um, for different exhibits. So um, the reason why most folks might not know this is because if you don't add a theme and configure it, uh, it never actually shows up. The, the UI element doesn't show up. So um, we had a, um, a use case at Stanford, and I'm gonna actually talk about this other, uh, this particular exhibit 
uh, later when I'm talking a bit more about our indexing. Um, but it was um, the Parker Manuscripts exhibit, uh, and it is an exhibit done in conjunction with some other institutions and for reasons um, they, you know, we didn't want the exhibit that we were building to be heavily Stanford branded like the rest of our exhibits. Um, like say for instance, you know, we have this pretty prominent, uh, these two bottom bars here, the library's bottom bar as well as the kind of global Stanford University wide bottom bar. Um, so there was kind of a strong uh, intention to not have that in that particular exhibit, um, as well as some other maybe smaller customizations. Um, that being said, this theming feature could be used for, uh, I mean, effectively what you get is um, to provide your own entirely custom uh, style sheet that just gets loaded for that exhibit. Um, you're able to load the base styles for your entire site that you can layer on top of, or you could write a completely new style sheet um, if you wanted to. And again, these can be selected on a per exhibit basis. So um, as you can see here, we have what we've just kind of dubbed the Parker theme. Um, and if I were to set this exhibit that I have there, uh, you'll notice the, the bottom bars completely disappeared. So we've, we've basically removed some of the Stanford branding, genericized it a little bit, and then we can kind of use this theme. Um, if we also did see fit for, you know, for other purposes, we could use this for other collaborations, kind of cross institution that maybe didn't want such a, such a heavy handed Stanford branding. Um, I'll add that back for now. Um, so this is this is a default spotlight thing. So anybody who's working with spotlight now is capable of adding uh, adding this into their into their um, application um, if they would like. Uh, so going into some of the things that we have implemented locally that are um, that are complete customizations for our institution. Um, as you can see in the configuration sidebar here, we have a, an, an additional option, which is viewers. Um, so our normal viewer that we ship with all of our exhibits is what we call Sewell Embed. Um, I don't know, if it, just for folks that aren't kind of familiar with it, it's a kind of simple OEmbed API service um, that just allows us to at any, kind of in any website or application really easily drop in a, um, a, a, a viewer representation for any one of the, uh, our objects in our repository. So that's kind of our default viewer strategy ac across many of our um, discovery applications. Um, and that was what we always had for all of our exhibits previously. Um, we did have the use case where, uh, you know, we're, we're Mirador uh, users as and kind of one of the kind of primary developers of Mirador. Um, so we use Mirador pretty heavily around the libraries. Um, and so it was useful for certain collections that maybe um, wanted to be able to have like side by side comparisons of IIIF objects. Uh, to be able to choose uh, Mirador instead of um, Sewell Embed. So let me actually, um, so here's, here's a record um, in this exhibit. You can see it's using Sewell Embed, but if I go ahead and uh, you know it's, uh, I guess you don't know it's Sewell Embed, but it's Sewell Embed because we're implementing the UV viewer here, the universal viewer. Um, so if I switch my exhibit to use Mirador uh, and I refresh this page, you're going to see instead of the universal viewer now I've now I'm loading up the Mirador viewer, which is you know has the you know, the ability to add other items via triple IF and drag and drop and and all that stuff. So you can kind of get a different experience. You can get um, a side by side comparison. So that was a, a configuration that we added locally. Um, I know that we've mentioned in maybe some of the community and or developer calls um, that you know if there was interest in getting this pushed upstream that you know we've done it in a way that should theoretically be portable. Um, upstream there. Uh, another thing I'll call out while I'm on this page, but I'll, I'll um, probably mention it a little bit more later, is we also had the ability to um, define custom IIIF manifests for objects. Um, this gave us the ability to um, say point to a non, um, a, a, one of our non-Stanford uh, or non-standard IIIF endpoints. Um, I'll explain more kind of when we get into our indexing. A uh, little bit deeper into the indexing. Um, okay, I'm gonna switch this back to Sewell Embed. All right. Um, so let's see. Um, another kind of interesting thing that we added, an interesting customization. Um, I'm gonna reload this page again. 
Uh, so we have a, a particular Ruby package that we use locally to handle our metadata display. Um, so all of the records or many of the records um, in, in exhibits are all kind of represented by these um, uh, mods records. Uh, we were finding that there was a lot of kind of really customized logic that we were looking for um, out of our indexing strategy. Uh, and as, as folks may know, kind of the spotlights uh, metadata display is really relatively basic. I mean, you just pluck out um, single or multi-valued fields from your index and render them on the page. Um, there is the ability to, you know, do some manipulation of that via configuration, but, um, you know, particularly with a vast uh, uh, number of potential items to be put into these exhibits, um, there was, you know, there's definitely complications around trying to do all the stuff that we wanted with our metadata. Um, we kind of found this compromise where we added this more details uh, pop up. So what this is doing, and while this maybe isn't like the greatest uh, example because the metadata that is displaying here is relatively good, it's, it's, it's pretty thorough. Um, but you can even, what you can even see down here is we're being able to pull out like the access conditions, use in production and copyright notices out of our mods record um, without necessarily having to go and for every kind of instance of every potential metadata field that could show up on our mods records, um, rendering them uh, or trying to get them into our index document and then configuring them uh, appropriately on the page. So um, anyways, we added this pop-up here and then you even have the ability um, to download that mods uh, record itself, which you know, I won't do, but it'll, just, it'll actually give the mods XML uh, full record to you. So we were able to add uh, all of this as kind of a customization on top of um, Spotlight. And I, and I will have to say, we really didn't do anything Spotlight specific. We really kind of used all base black light configurations and, and, and functionality to, to drive this display and, and um, pop up. Um, one thing that I can't actually show, but uh, maybe Kathy could, or, or maybe she could at least mention it, but um, I, another kind of interesting customization that we added in a recent sprint, um, and maybe what I can, well, I, I'm not sure, I, I've got a good encode example, but um, well, I'll, I'll pull something up in code. Um, and by the way, our, our, our repository is open source, so you can see all these customizations I'm talking about at uh, GitHub, Sewell hyphen DLSS slash exhibits. Um, uh, so one of the things that we added is we added a, um, a exhibits bot. Um, this is basically a simple chat bot um, that can talk uh, to Slack channels. Um, so we, you know, we have a Slack channel uh, or Slack organization. And um, so we have the ability while, oops, um, you know, this is kind of a, a generic uh, class here, but we have this exhibit bot class. And what you can see is at any time we can just say, you know, exhibit bot message and then send it some text. And what this is configured to do is uh, Kathy has a, uh, a, a particular channel in our Slack organization. Um, and the only thing that we're doing this for now is, um, let's see, is, um, to, to send notifications when the publish state changes from an exhibit. So uh, what happens is anytime the publish state of an exhibit changes, so it either goes from unpublished to published or from published to unpublished, um, our exhibits bot will go into the Slack channel and we'll send this little message saying the spotlight exhibit, um, you know, with this title was either published or unpublished at this time and date and here's the URL to it. Um, so that, you know, our, our service team knows when new exhibits either come into production or when, for whatever reason, a per current existing production exhibit decided that it wanted to unpublish itself. Um, our service team will know about that. Um, okay, so I think uh, I'm going to jump into our kind of our, our indexing um, pipeline and kind of how we've implemented indexing in our uh, instance. Um, so as uh, folks are probably familiar with in the curation um, section, uh, there is this items uh, link. And if I were to go into the, the add items button, um, you know, typically you will have, you have, you have your, by default, your upload item, upload multiple items, um, IIIF URL and, and, and the such. 
Um, so what we've actually added is this from uh, external resource uh, tab. And so this is basically from, at least in our context, um, I'll mention this bib text thing in a moment here, but realistically the, uh, the kind of the, the interesting bit here being um, the stuff from the SDR or the Stanford Digital Repository. So um, you'll notice right away, we have a, a section open here with this. Uh, uh, this is one of uh, an identifier of an item in our repository. Um, this happens to be a collection identifier. So we do have an endpoint where, you know, given a particular um, identifier, it will A, first go check to see if it's a collection. And if it is, go get all of the ch child identifiers of that and send that through the indexing pipeline too. So what you're seeing here is we have this one document, it, it is a collection, and then it indexes not only this document, but all of its child documents as well. Um, you have the ability to check the status uh, of an item. So what you can see here is, you know, we, uh, this, is, this is basically just going through and just checking, you know, uh, the indexing state. And I think, I believe this is all, you know, part of the, the, the basic resource uh, information that's stored as uh, Spotlight is indexing. But we can, you know, we know that this thing has 22 items and, and we were able to give this basic, you know, this basic status about this. Um, also, we can, uh, if you only have a few items, it will list them all here, but um, you can um, auto-complete here if you know the items uh, that are in your, your um, um, what's it called, uh, in, in your exhibit. So, well, that seems to not be working right now, but theoretically, uh, there we go. I don't know why it was uh, bugging out for me for a second, but you can auto-complete for um, items in your exhibit and then you can go and you'll actually be able to pull um, the status of whether that item had been published, if there was an error state for that item or maybe it couldn't find that item. Um, for whatever reason, you would also, it, it would give you that information here. So um, exhibit admins and, and I think, I'm guessing, yeah, just, it, exhibit admins and curators can kind of interrogate the uh, indexing status of particular documents in their exhibit. Um, so kind of some of the, I, said, I also want to talk about some of the kind of not necessarily exhibits spotlight or blacklight specific infrastructure, but kind of the, the, the way that this all works um, is we have a Perl uh, persistent URL service. So perl.stanford.edu. Um, so say for instance, this is that one of those documents that I was looking at. Um, and uh, at any of these documents, if it's a published, uh, and I should mention that the only items that are available to bring into exhibits via this mechanism um, are published uh, exhibit items. So um, for any one of these documents, uh, if it's a published item, you can get to these, this kind of public XML representation that we have. So we have um, information here that's useful for our indexing pipeline, such as um, you know, where all of the images are. Um, there, there's lots of information, you know, rights information. There's so there's information um, in this XML that's available to us publicly, uh, as well as um, by just adding dot mods to our, our Perl URLs, um, we can get the full mods record. So this is kind of the, the, the two endpoints that we use um, in our indexing pipeline. So given that I drop in a Druid, uh, we can we know that we have these two endpoints where we can go and get the information that we need and send it and just as Jen just showed before, basically take that XML, um, transform that into that solar that 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 solar document hash object um, that was there with the you know the identifier and here's the triple IF URL endpoints and title and and this that and the other thing and then even you know this is the raw mods XML itself which we use to drive something like this more details um, panel here. Um, so, so all of those things are pulled into our, through our indexing pipeline into the solar document for, uh, you know, say this document in, in exhibits and then sent into Spotlight's uh, resource indexer. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the rough overview of our SDR, um, uh, the SDR pipeline. Uh, one thing I was mentioning the Parker exhibit uh, previously, um, and so this is the one where you know we remove that bottom branding. Um, so the Parker exhibit, um, kind of, we did some really custom indexing for this. 
so while there are items that are um, that are present in the repository, uh, there are lots of there's lots of content here that we're also indexing from other places. So what you'll notice is we have this, you know, in our facet, we have our collection and our and our archive manuscript. These are our these are our items that are actually in SDR. Um, and I'm going to kind of hand wave through some of this because I know we're not like super super long on time here. Um, but when I, when we were showing that viewers um, that viewers uh, configuration, this is one of the exhibits that takes it. Uh, advantage of one of these custom triple IF manifest configurations. So we have uh, manifests that are generated for these objects uh, on a separate server. And I won't go into super deep detail as to why that is, but uh, basically we're, we're taking advantage of some kind of more modern features of triple IF that our infrastructure doesn't currently handle, um, but we needed to leverage those features for this exhibit. So we are able to generate those manifests on this separate server um, that have the information that we need to, to, to facilitate some of the features that we have here. And what those are is, um, if I go back into that search, um, is that when we, uh, when we go ahead and index an item from an SDR, we also go and check that manifest um, for um, annotations. So we're actually going and indexing the uh, content that is annotated in these documents. Um, so say, for instance, um, we can go to these page details. So these are, these are actually annotations on this document. Um, we'll go pull this in, but it will um, kind of slowly come in and actually pop up that, this, uh, that kind of the annotation that we've indexed. So you can actually do full text searching on the annotations in these documents, find the documents, uh, pull them up, and actually pull the annotation up. So um, there was definitely, uh, while all of your resource indexing is done kind of in a custom way, um, there, I guess this is, I'm just trying to show that we kind of have this way to uh, build this exhibit within our kind of exhibits platform, although it had some very uh, custom indexing strategies that it needed. Uh, but we were able to, particularly because of how we've modeled this data, uh, we were able to kind of handle that on a um, uh, on a uh, on a case by case basis. So when we go and try to index the Parker content, we know that it, it, because of where the references are, that it has this content. And while we're indexing the rest of our SDR content, just because those references don't exist, we just don't attempt to index things like annotations and references. Um, so uh, we were able to implement this exhibit with its very custom needs into our exhibits platform without having to spin off a whole new spotlight instance um, or having to like reinvent our entire indexing strategy uh, from the ground up. Um, so I think that that is about all I, um, I had for my demo. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, um, Jesse. That was really great. And we have, I just want to um, tell the handful of people that we have who sort of regularly participate in this call. Um, if, if we have um, questions that fill up the whole rest of our hour, we can conduct some of our business and planning for next month's call um, via email. Um, so I just, I didn't want to constrain things here if there's a lot of questions. So um, with, with no further ado, um, I would say uh, hopefully we're not all unmuting at once, but um, whoever has a question, please, please uh, chime in. Hi, this is uh, Will Cowan at Indiana University. Did anyone hear me? Yes, Will, we hear you. Thanks for introducing yourself. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, I have a question on the, uh, the sync uh, between SDR and the exhibit. Is that a, a one-time uh, uh, insert of the, the record into the exhibit? And if that record is updated or changed, does the, that, do you then need to sort of, sort of redo that, uh, uh, that synchronization between the, two, between the digital repository and the exhibit? 
Yeah, it's currently handled in a in a kind of manual based on a manual way, uh, kind of based on the exhibit curator or administrator um, reindexing their own items. Uh, so I guess the kind of the, the notion is there if they know that their metadata has changed, um, they can go into their exhibit and there's a reindex all items or something like that uh, button on that items page and they can click that and then uh, the exhibit will just go and send that into its background worker queue and, and asynchronously uh, send re-index all the content in your exhibit. Okay. And, and, and when, I'll, when... I will mention though really quick is and, and one of the reasons why we'll probably want to move away from that is because um, especially how I mentioned like uh, I added uh, an exhibit druid or an identifier of an exhibit it went and grabbed all the items if one of those items goes dark or gets removed, we don't get a message that that happened. We go, the next time we go to re-index, we go and say, all right, what are all the identifiers for this, for this exhibit, or sorry, for this collection? Um, it gives me the list of identifiers with that identifier now removed, but we don't, we're not being intelligent about that. And we just say, okay, I'll go re-index all these things. And the previous document that had been removed from the SDR is still there. And that's been a problem for us. Yeah, in, in an earlier application when we were playing around with Spotlight, uh, uh, this is a curation concerns application, so it shows you how old it is. Uh, we basically on the save, we were uh, having the solar index for the exhibit get updated on that save so that if someone went in and made modifications to a, to a given uh, record in the, in the repository, it would automatically update that information into, into the uh, exhibits. Uh, solar index. Very cool. Yeah, but, we, we've been looking at some other kind of for, for a kind of a completely unrelated project, but something that we um, that we are working on right now, trying to look at kind of similar patterns of how we can uh, start triggering information more uh, accurately in places like discovery environments, uh, when content changes in the SDR gets removed. Yeah. Yeah, we've, we've used on a couple of other applications, we've used uh, uh, camel routes, which are part of Fedora uh, to, to be able to go in and update uh, different solar indexes depending, uh, depending what the application is doing. Great. Um, thank you for that question, Will. Um, who else has a question? Yeah, uh, it's Randy Stern at Harvard. So uh, question, about that, question about that pop-up metadata panel uh, in Spotlight, a couple of questions about that. So it, it looked like part of the reason you did that is because the pop-up thing has things like repeating fields and that sort of thing in it. Is that true? And also the pop-up metadata, is that, um, is that being pulled from the Spotlight Solar Index or is it coming directly from your repository external to the to Spotlight, or what's the source of that pop-up metadata? Uh, it's a raw trans. It's a transformation of the raw mods XML, which is stored in an index field in the Spotlight Index. So each each solar document in the Spotlight Index has a, a, a field that contains the raw mods XML. Um, so that's that. and then, yeah, and then so we, it's not broken, they're not broken out into separate Spotlight no. fields as it were. No, no, and and that was kind of our our. That was basically the reason is because we were also getting so much, um, we were getting a lot of churn on metadata requirements for Spotlight that in a lot of cases it was defined as like the SearchWorks metadata display already does this. And SearchWorks is our, our kind of main black light catalog. Um, like the SearchWorks metadata, metadata display does this. And that was kind of how we were categorizing things. So like, why don't we just use the SearchWorks metadata display in exhibits and stop, you know, stop trying to do things in two places. Um, so we have, we are, SearchWorks already used a, a shared library that we have for rendering uh, mods XML kind of into HTML in the way that, you know, Stanford libraries likes it, I guess. Um, and so we, we, yeah, we basically just took that gem, put it in, put, put the, the, the rendering of its output into that pop-up. Um, and then now, anytime when we have requirements changes for our metadata display, we make it in the one place and it can affect multiple discovery environments. And, and I, can, I can see why that's easier kind of technically to manage that. Is, did, did the users find it okay to have a separate pop-up panel like that as opposed to it being in the main 
page? And maybe that's a question for Kathy. Um, yeah, um, you know, we, we have not gotten any negative feedback about that. The, the only concerns that it has raised is that it exposes um, sort of our heterogeneity of metadata approaches over the years, which sometimes doesn't look so clean. So it kind of exposes the warts. So the people, <laughs> some of the metadata folks get a little exercised about that, but it's definitely exposing more information to people. And we, it was probably all of the user feedback we got showing more metadata was the most requested item. So. Um, uh, thanks, Randy, for your question. Um, who else has a question? No one else says I have another question. Um, <laughs> um, go the, ahead. The full, text, the full text indexing of annotations that you mentioned, um, is that in the um, Spotlight Solar Index, or is that, again, in an external full text index of some kind. They're they're all, they're all internal uh, internal and in, it's all in the internal index. So they're each each annotation itself and and in our case, if I'm not mistaken, and it's been a little bit while it's been a little while since we worked on this. I think the annotation for that content is effectively the entire contents of the page annotated. Um, it, it, they're all individual documents in solar with relationship references to the um, to the SDR item that that thing is annotated into. I see. And the red and an ordinary solar query against Spotlight's solar index can search those, yeah, those fields. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah. So you can the, the content is in there in like a, a text field um that that can be searched um so that so the actual annotation content can be searched itself um and then as well as we can when that when that content is pulled up we're able to point you to the particular um object that it's in to the particular canvas that it's on and then actually load uh say in this case mirador with that annotation enabled Okay, um, I saw that there was a question in the chat channel um, that Jesse answered. Thank you, um, Doran, for, um, for submitting that. Are there other questions? Well, I've got another one. Okay. Uh, this is for Jen. I guess this one's for Jen then. Um, so you were doing a query, I think, against your blacklight your main catalog's blacklight instance sort of pull in data into Spotlight? Yep, it's not our, it's not our like Mark catalog, it's the, the catalog of our, our digital collections, which is separate. Which is blacklight, yeah, yeah. Um, I see, so you, so you added that, that kind of feature to to as a plug-in, this because we did something somewhat similar, but it's not directly against the blacklight instance. It's against um, we built an OAI data provider that pulls stuff in. I see. So yours was directly against your blacklight instance. So it's it's actually going against the solar behind the blacklight instance. Um, it'd be better to do it against blacklight itself, but it was faster to do it against, up against solar. Mm -hmm. So, so are all items that you might want to include in an exhibit um, in your Blacklight instance? Um, or, 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 some, or you might want to pull things from other places as well. So we might want to, so right now, if they want things from other places, then we ask them to do a bulk upload with a spreadsheet, which is that add multiple items tab in the item curation. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, but I would like to build more. I'd like to build a connection to our maybe to our D space, but I haven't done that yet. Okay, um, I just wanted to um, sort of insert a plug here in the chat channel. Um, 
although it is a little bit service heavy, um, we we have intent intentionally so. But you know, the development community is welcome to link to or contribute in any in any way. I put a link to our Duraspace Wiki, Spotlight Community Wiki. So there's lots of information there, and um, please check it out. And all you have to do to contribute to that is to get a um, to register for a Duraspace account. Um, we've left it left it open so that anyone can contribute. And um, thanks for thanks for checking that out. Um, let's see. It looks like there's a couple of other questions. Jesse's answering on the fly. Thank you. Um, does does anybody else have um, additional questions here? Going once. <laughs> Twice. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. What I'm going to go ahead and do is stop the recording, and I will, um, I will be sharing this on the um, Code for Live listserv, a link, and also to the Spotlight Community listserv. And I want to thank everyone for joining today, and big thanks again to Jen Colt and Jesse Keck. And for those who would like to stay on, on the line for Spotlight Service Community Business, we have a couple minutes for that. Thank you.